we're looking at metabolic disorders and we are looking at part two of metabolic disorders. So imbalance of potassium and calcium pose serious problems in the newborn's cardiac activity. Cranial ketonuria is a metabolic disorder which the baby is unable to metabolize amino acid phenylalanine, which is found in almost all protein foods, especially the breast milk or even the formula. So this session, we're going to look at hypokalemia and hyperkalemia and then phenylketonuria, which is also a not a very common condition here in Africa. At the end of the session, the students will be able to explain hypo and hyperkalemia, the causes and the clinical manifestations, discuss the metabolic disorder, clinophytonuria, and then describe the management of this disorder and also that of potassium, and also explain the complications associated with these. So we're looking at hypo and hyperkalemia as well as phenylketonuria. So once again, these are readings for you to further enhance your understanding. Hypo and hyperkalemia. So when you hear hypo and hyper, you already know, but kalemia is potassium. So when we have potassium in the extra fluid, the normal range is 3.5 to 5.0. And it's important that you know some of these values. So small deviations causes serious life-threatening, especially in physiologic function, because Potassium is one of the major electrolytes, especially in cardiac function. And there, there is a reciprocal relationship between sodium and potassium. We said this earlier when we treated hyponatremia. We said that when hypokalemia is a decrease in the potassium in the extracellular fluid, and this may come as a result of some gastrointestinal disturbance and the use of some drugs, diuretics, that are not potassium sparing. Example is fusimide. So you have it wasting it and getting it out as well as because you want to get out of sodium. But because of the relationship between sodium and potassium, when you are getting rid of sodium, potassium also comes along with it. We have laxatives and then also even diarrhea and corticosteroids and some antibiotics may also deplete or put the newborn or child at risk of hypokalemia. So hyperkalemia is also increased in the extracellular, which is the opposite of hypokalemia. And here we're saying that some potassium sparing directors. So when it spares the potassium, then you may also have the risk of having high levels of it because sodium goes and then there are high level of potassium. And then central nervous system agents and then oral and intravenous replacement of potassium salts. So when we have high levels of uh, Potassium, once again, I said in Ghana, we use a millimole per liter. So we prefer to say 7.0 millimole per liter. And it is a life-threatening condition. And it's commonly found among the preterm infants within the first 48 hours or 12 hours of life. It's also associated with kidney failure and sometimes the use of diuretics. And if left untreated, can result in some cardiac arrhythmias that can result to death. Risk factors. We have said that prematurity is a factor, low systemic blood flow, renal failure, and others that we have listed here will inform you, including sepsis. Complications. Hyperkalemia can lead, if left, can lead to tall T waves, ventricular arrhythmias, widening QRST and QRS complex, cardiac arrest and death. And the slides uploaded on Sakai, you have an, an example of 
the ECG in there to look at, to look at some of the descriptions we have in terms of ECG exhibition. Diagnosis. The infants are at risk of hyperkalemia. Here, we're saying that when we do the blood urea electrolyte test, we see this. In addition to the signs and symptoms uh, ex uh, elicited earlier, and then we are also saying that infants born less than 24 weeks of life have, should have serum potassium checked every six hours and 12 hours, and then also at 48 hours to rule out this problem. And also blood gas analyzer also provides a rapid estimation of potassium and helps us to identify this life-threatening condition early. Once again, we say in the arterial blood, puncture, free or venous specimen could also be used in this. And then hemolysis commonly occurs when we take it from the heel prick. So it may also give us false reading. So we must note this. And then ECG assessment is also diagnostic. So the blood gas analyzer is what you have here, a very small portable gadget that can be used to assess blood gas in the unit. Once again, we have very few. Those that are here are normally in the intensive care unit. So you don't have this even in the baby unit and even in the wards. So it's sometimes difficult to assess this. And this is very helpful when we have it. It helps us to identify and treat early. Prevention. We avoid potassium in all infusions in the first day of life. In infants born premature, unless there is hypokalemia and adequate renal function. Please, it's very, very important. So in management, we have this algorithm to guide us. Serum potassium of six millimole without ECG changes. You monitor the potassium every hour or two hourly using blood gas analyzer. And serum potassium, seven millimole with normal ECG is first line glucose insulin infusion. And then if the potassium persists, then salbutamol infusion of four micrograms in five mils of water are given over 20 minutes. This is a treatment. And then when arrhythmias are appearing, then we give 10% calcium gluconate. It's also important to note that glass calcium gluconate causes necrosis of tissues. So it is not recommended that it is given by scalp vein because it will cause necrosis of the tissues on the head. And it must also be given with caution to make sure that it is going intravenously. If not, it causes necrosis in the muscles. And if acidosis, we give bicarbonate, 4.2% of bicarbonate. And that is also based on the weight. So for the weight times, the deficit of 0 0.3 centimeters in terms of calculation. So this is done and then the drug is given. So refractory hyperkalemia is also a condition. And the management are, you use both insulin and dextrose and salbutamol infusions. This is in the worst states. And then also salbutamol infusion, one gram per kilogram, it can also be given per rectum, up to six hourly as necessary. And red cells transfusion with wash pack red cells are also given. And then also the pediatrician is also called or the renal physician to consider dialysis when there is kidney involvement. So now we're looking at hypokalemia. We're saying that this is when there are low levels or uh, low, abnormally low levels of potassium. And the moderate hypokalemia cal is observed when the serum is between 2.5 to 3.0 millimole per liter. And severe 
hypokalemia results when it is below 2.5 millimole and if left untreated can result in cardiac arrhythmias that can be also uh, fatal. Causes. Neonatal hypokalemia may be caused by increased renal losses and then increased extracellular as a result of diarrhea or whatever and also we have redistribution and also prolonged insufficient potassium intake. So once again, the signs and symptoms that may occur are resulted in changes in striated muscle, smooth muscles, and heart muscles. So these are some muscles that you need potassium for contractility. So maximum, there will be some proximal muscle weakness observed when there is depletion in hypokalemia. So you see that the lower extremities and uh, there will be some weakness and there will be severe weakness and paralysis of even the respiratory causing respiratory distress and also respiratory arrest may be observed and that may also result in death in severe cases. So ECG is also very necessary here and on the ECG we see that there is increase in the amplitude of the P waves, there is prolonged gation of the PR and the QT intervals. There is also decrease or a depression in the ST segments and there is also appearance of U waves are observed in the ECGs. So this is also diagnostic and this may also be seen on ECG. However, ECG changes may not always correlate with the level of hypokalemia. So there are some exceptions, and this is good to note. Diagnosis. We say in the laboratory investigations are done to look at the bicarbonate, the magnesium, and other electrolytes, aldosterone, and blood gases. And we have said that ECG for cardiac findings are very, very important, and echocardiography may be necessary in severe cases. Management. The primary aim of therapy is to prevent and treat life-threatening cardiac and muscular complications. The necessary aim is to replenish the body's potassium store. And so we give some amounts of potassium in the fluid. So one to two millimole per kilogram body weight per day. And there is also the presence of severe symptomatic hypokalemia in cases where there is gastrointestinal complications. So when you have conditions like paralysis in the uh, uh, GIT, there is a need to also give some intravenous replacement because we have said that these muscles require potassium for proper muscle contractility. And also dextrose may should not be used in the initial fluid because it increases in insulin secretion secondary to dextrose infusion and may lower plasma potassium concentration even further. So we are saying that in the choice of intravenous fluid, dextrose is not an option. The choice of the type of potassium salt depends on the clinical situation. Potassium chloride is usually appropriate if hypovolemia is present. In the presence of simultaneous metabolic acidosis, then other potassium salt producing, like potassium bicarbonate, potassium citrate, potassium acetate, may be given. So depending on the magnitude and what is the problem at stake. And then in cases of hypokalemia should be considered. So this is a differential diagnosis. And in these cases, the potassium levels are normal in the magnesium treatment, following magnesium treatment. So because of the relationship, and it should be kept in mind that correction of total body potassium deficit may take days and even weeks. This is the end of our presentation.